On today's episode of the CX Insider podcast, we sit down and talk with best-selling business author and customer service speaker Shep Hyken. We'll be talking about Shep's journey with customer experience, with stories and tales that go back decades. We'll also be talking about the development of AI and chat GPT, with Shep Hyken discussing the customer experience use cases. Enjoy the episode, and if you do, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more episodes. This episode has been brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Now let's get into the episode. So, welcome back to the CX Inside podcast. I'm your host Octavian and I'm joined by my co-host Greg. And we've got a special guest today that goes by the name of Shep Hyken. So, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, your journey? Sure, sure. Well, this is what I do for a living. I've been doing it, believe it or not, for 40 years. And if you can trace back the origins of my desire to take care of customers, it goes all the way back to when I was 12 years old. I started my first business And I've shared this story many times, but it was a birthday party magic show business where I would go out and entertain little screaming kids at their birthday parties. And I came home after my first magic show, uh, my first paid gig. I was paid $16. And back then, that was a lot of money. Then today's dollars, it's like $2,412. But anyway, I digress. My mom said to write a thank you note. My dad said, call in a week thank them again, make sure they were happy. And I said, well, what do I say? Just ask them, how did you like the show? And then my dad said, but get specific, ask them what tricks they like the best. And over a period of time, you'll start to see like what tricks people talk about and what they don't talk about. And then he said, get rid of the tricks that people aren't talking about, replace them with tricks that people do talk about. So all of that was like, it made a lot of sense to me as a little kid. But when I graduated college and I decided what I wanted to do for a living and I thought back as to what, what got me most excited, it was that. It was pleasing people. And what my parents were teaching me back in, at age 12 was this is customer experience. Show appreciation. Get feedback. Uh, get specific feedback operationalize the feedback to make a better product and make a better experience. And I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. I had no idea it was called customer service or experience, but but that's what it was. And when I talk to my clients today, and I know you mentioned uh, a guest uh, that you recently had on the show uh, from Cisco. I mean, companies like Cisco, huge companies, companies like IBM, uh, companies like Amazon, guess what? They do exactly what my parents were teaching me to do back at age 12. It's not any different whether you're a huge business or a solo entrepreneur or a 12-year-old kid doing a magic show. So as I I got into this, uh, and by the way, the reason I got into it, I I continued to do my magic through high school and college, and I graduated from birthday parties to corporate events eventually and nightclubs, comedy clubs. But I, I I wanted to do something like this when I got out of college, but I was bored with magic shows. And I saw a couple of motivational speakers. And I thought, there you go. I can do that. Had the chops from being on stage. I felt comfortable. And I just took everything I knew how to do on the platform and honed it into a business presentation. And that's how it all started. And here I am today, uh, as I mentioned, 40 years later. Yeah, I know I don't look that old. Hopefully, I don't feel that old. Sometimes I do, but not often. And uh, I am learning from every client I work with. I read, uh, I don't know if you, people can't see behind me, I've got a stack of books. Uh, I probably read 35, 40 books a year if I'm, I'm on a good year. Uh, I do a lot of airplane time, and that's a great thing to do when you're on an airplane is, is uh, educate yourself a little bit. So I am constantly a student of what I, I am involved in, and, and I just love it. I, I still do. It's the only thing I've done. I'm very passionate about it. It's, it's good to constantly learn. That's a good amount of books to read a year. Well, very good. And, and actually, there's probably many more books that I skim and realize I'm not going to take a deeper dive into it. Um, and, and the beautiful thing in my business, people send me books every single week. I think uh, today is uh, Thursday. I've already received two books this week. So... <laughs> <laughs> go, will you look at this book? Will you comment yeah. on the book? Will you use me on, because I have my own show and I write columns for different publications. Would you, would you consider a, a review of the book? And, and it's great to learn uh, from so many different resources. And I got to tell you, when, when a book captures my attention and after the first, oh, maybe 10, 15 pages, I will deep dive. I will take notes, um, you know, use my highlighter 
and uh, learn. And then oftentimes, yeah, it does turn into an idea that formulates in my head. And then I'll eventually write about it or talk about it from the stage. Don't necessarily say, hey, this is what I learned from that book, but here's a book that I read and this is my interpretation of it. So sometimes it's different from the authors, but I love to be challenged to think. And to your point, it's a lot of books. It'd be nice if everybody took, you know, 15, 20 minutes to read every day. And I don't care if you read nonfiction uh, books like I read. Uh, every once in a while, about every four or five books, I drop in a fun fiction book, a trashy novel. <laughs> <laughs> just to get my creativity. Uh, but I also read a lot of magazine articles. Every day I receive Google alerts on articles related to customer service experience, employee experience, call center, support centers. And I probably read 10, 12 articles a day on top of all of this. So uh, I'm immersed in my industry and immersed in learning as much as I can. Well, speaking of books, you are a New York Times bestseller. So could you tell us a bit more about your extensive collection of books that you've written? What made you become an author in the first place? Yeah, I wrote, I've written eight books. My first book I wrote in the uh, late 1980s uh, titled Moments of Magic, uh, How to Be a Star with Your Customer and Keep Them Forever. To this day, I still talk about moments of magic in my speech. And uh, by the way, to share what that is, uh, every time a customer interacts with you, it's an opportunity for them to form an impression. I don't care what kind of business you're in, B2B, B2C, any type of business. That's called the moment of truth. And that idea came from Jan Carlson, who was at Scandinavian Airlines. And he, he wrote about that in an article in the early 1980s, and it eventually turned into a book uh, called Moments of Truth. So from that, moments of truth go one of three ways. Uh, they can be, uh, and this is my take on it. He said it could be good and bad. I added a third way. Uh, the bad ones, by the way, I call moments of misery. The, the one in the middle he didn't talk about is average or satisfactory, and I call that a moment of mediocrity. And then I have the moment of magic, hence <laughs> the title of the book, which is any positive experience. If you return my call quickly, um, Wow, that was a moment of magic. Thanks for calling me back so quickly. If we have a disaster and you go above and beyond to take care of it, well, that's a moment of magic as well. It doesn't matter whether they're tiny or they're huge. So that was my first book. And then I, I wrote a number of books, most recent book titled, I'll Be Back, How to Get Your Customers to Come Back Again and Again. And by the way, in every book I write, I actually start out with a review of the concept of the moment of magic idea that I had, because that really, to me, is the heart of it all. A consistent and predictable experience that's always meeting, if not even slightly exceeding expectations, is what makes customers say that company or that person is amazing. I'm, I'm maybe going to combine a couple of questions we had, actually, Shep, which is, how have you seen customer experience change over the years? But then how do you try and summarize where you see CX today? Do you think that, for example, when you wrote that book, do you think we have reached that place now for a majority or we still got a long way to go? Oh, we are on a journey that's so exciting. When you say, do we have a long way to go? I think there's a lot more opportunity to create a better experience. And we don't even know how we're going to do it yet. The technology is going to improve and new things are going to happen. Innovation is going to be there. But let's go back into the traditional way of getting customer service. Long before you, we were all born was we had two choices. Well, I guess we had three choices. Uh, we could go back to wherever we bought it in person. Um, we could pick up the phone and try to talk to somebody. There weren't call centers way, way, way back then. We can send a letter <laughs> and hope that we get a response. And then uh, when I got into it, and if you look back, by the way, in my, my book, uh, and I updated the Moments of Magic book uh, to a more modern version of it, you need to get back to your customers quickly. So fax them. <laughs> there was no email when I wrote that. <laughs> book or, or when I first started. So, uh, you know, think about that. That's, that's pretty crazy. I mean, we're so mm -hmm. used to all these things. And many of us, if you were born in the 1980s or, or later, I mean, you don't remember a world without email, uh, probably don't remember a world without a mobile phone. You know, there's so many great opportunities and great innovations that have happened. Well, I, I think there's a great generation of young people today. When I say young, I'm talking little kids that will grow up not knowing a world without chat GPT or similar technologies. So yep. 
I digress, but let's go back. Uh, today, we have so many different channels, hence the word multi-channel or omni-channel, ways customers can connect with us. There's the internet, there's social media, there's apps that companies have just for their customers. Uh, there's the ability to go and, and call somebody and be told, hey, your hold time's 10 minutes, we can call you back if that's more convenient. I mean, there's so many great things that have happened to drive a better experience. We are far from uh, it ever being over. I believe even the best companies who you would rate at 10 out of 10 every time, it's a journey. It's not a destination. Take a look at Amazon. Um, I just read an article yesterday. There's uh, um, an international company that's coming in and they say, is this the company that's going to topple Amazon? And and by the way, I responded with a comment saying, Amazon's not going to get toppled by a company. You don't think uh, they weren't expecting that one day there would be competition to what they do? They're an innovator. Yeah. And they have pushed the envelope so far and they have forced, and this is real important because anytime a customer has a great experience with any company, and I'll use Amazon as an example, because when I ask people in the audience that when I'm speaking, hey, who are your favorite companies to do business with? People always say, well, we love Amazon. Why? Reliability, consistency, predictability. And you know what they do? They inform you. Uh, your, your, your order has been accepted. Your order is out for delivery. And here's the tracking information if you want to watch it. Your order has been received. They let you know every step of the way. They give you confidence. So what happens if I'm in another business? And again, it doesn't matter what the business is. I could be selling um, software to companies. I could be selling electronic parts to manufacturers. I could be selling direct to consumer, any product. Our customers are going to compare us to the best experience they've ever had. That could be Amazon. It could be a restaurant down the street. It could be an inside sales rep at a manufacturer uh, who's just amazing and stays on top of everything. And this customer says, <clears throat> why can't this company be as good as that company? So the stakes are higher, and it's high- they're higher because great companies are setting the bar high. It's a really interesting trend that I do. I, I think that that goes across all industries as well. Would you agree in terms of what you expect in retail is the same as now what you'd expect in healthcare and industries right. previously where customer slash patient experience wasn't considered to be at the forefront. I think you could argue now it is. A hundred percent. I don't know of one product or one service from any company or any industry that couldn't use customer service and experience as a competitive differentiator. You know, there's a reason that yeah. hospitals and medical systems now advertise on billboards, at least they do here in the U.S. They want your business. And in order to get your business, and they, and here's the thing, customers don't want to go to the hospital, but they when they are sick or they have an injury, they want to go to the hospital they like. Okay. And if I go to this emergency yeah. room and I have to wait 17 hours to get in, it's highly unlikely that I will try that hospital again, unless it's the only one and the only choice I have. I'll go see if I get a better experience elsewhere. And you mentioned also there about, you know, AI, chat, GPT, et cetera. In the organizations you're working with right now, how are you seeing AI being applied to make a difference? So a huge opportunity with AI. And AI has been around for quite a while. It's just AI hasn't been accessible to the general public as in consumers as much uh, as it has been in the last year or so. Really, it was November of last year when ChatGPT was introduced to the public that all of a sudden people started to say, wow, this is really incredible. But if you think about it, uh, let's just look at our basic... uh, Outlook inbox, you know, our email uh, Outlook, Um, there's a junk folder, and Outlook is trying to determine what should go into the junk folder. Sometimes it's wrong, no doubt about that. That's AI working in the background to make that happen. So whether we know it or not, we've been using AI for years. Now, that's a very, very basic example. But in today's world with AI, most uh and i and if you go back and look at some of the articles will ai take over the world and i think of that um uh, what is that that will smith movie um where uh, like the machines took over and i AI, robot uh, i robot right i we're not going there no, i think that's it yeah 
So I don't think we're, we're, we we do have to worry about, uh, you know, does AI give us fake information by accident? So here's how it's working in the customer service and experience world. Everybody's worried about, uh, you know, the chat bot when that first came around where we could create a knowledge base where we have here's answers to questions. However, uh, the questions that the customer asked, there were key words in that question that triggered an answer. And I'll give you an example of when it goes wrong. Uh, I was getting ready to buy a docking station for my computer. I use this example a lot, but I think it's perfect. It's perfect. So I'm online. I'm looking at this on their website and a little box pops up that says, can I help you? Now, this is not a human talking to me. This is a chat bot. And I said, I'm looking at this docking station for my computer where I want to plug it in and have it then connect to my, you know, my little laptop connects to my big monitors and my keyboard. Uh, do I need a separate cord to charge it or does it, uh, by plugging in, will start to charge the computer automatically? The response came back, which computer do you want to buy? And I wrote back, I don't want to buy a computer. I want to buy the docking station. Does it charge the computer? Yes. And the next response was, which computer do you want to buy? Okay. So that's not working, right? Now, in today's world, that chatbot, if it's run by AI and it's using generative AI, chat GPT like technologies, and there's other technologies similar to that, it's going to recognize that it gave me the wrong answer by my response. And it's going to ask me, could you clarify what you're asking me, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm confused. I want to buy the docking station. Okay, great. What do you want to know about the docking station? Does it charge the computer? Oh, I understand now. Uh, yes, it does. Okay, now I've got the answer. And that was a conversation I had with the computer, not a stock answer the computer gave me based on if the customer says this, then tell them that. So, most companies today, and I know this because we recently, Captura did um, a study and I helped with the study. We asked, uh, like in the context in our world, are you, because of AI, are you reducing staff, keeping them the same or increasing staff? And I believe it was 63% said we are increasing staff. Uh, the majority said we're keeping the same, uh, well, uh, the rest of the number, which is obviously 47 or 37%. Most of those, uh, companies are maintaining only a small, I believe is 9% said they're reducing staff, which tells me that customer service is not going to be taken away and replaced with artificial intelligence. Here's another reason why AI is not used just for customers. It's used for the agents to help customers. Even though it's really good, customers still need to talk to a human if the complicated issue uh, is beyond. Maybe there's multiple issues happening at once, and it takes a human to be able to put that together at this point anyway. Yeah. A common topic of conversation we have is that human to human interaction is unparalleled and for the foreseeable it probably will remain unparalleled and therefore like you say technologies and things like that that sit in the background if you can better support the actual individuals to connect and to serve in in the best possible way then that's going to be such a strong play so shep has worked with countless incredible clients like american airlines at&t and american express but what does shep hyken love to see when working with his clients and what is some good advice for companies to think about in this day and age oh gosh we there, everything's i mean i love to see when a client says you know what we're really good at what we do uh we need to get better here's what's interesting in my world I'm hired to go and do speeches on customer experience and customer service. We also do training projects. I have trainers that deliver my content in a more uh, in-depth, you know, workshop type of environment. And here's what's crazy. My typical client is not one that needs, needs help. Probably less than 20% of my clients who call me say, we are in trouble. Please help us. I assess why they're in trouble. It's pretty interesting. And I'm not sure that I'll be able to help them because they, they look at training like that often as a band-aid. But the companies that embrace what we do, like there, we just, I just received the most incredible testimonial from a client 
And I was just shocked. And they showed me pictures of the walls of their employees that are on the wall and they're using terminology. They've been working with us for five years and I've seen this growth in, in number one, uh, employee retention. That's a real good indicator. If you've got good things happening inside an organization, the customer is going to feel it on the outside. When they're looking at their metrics and they see customer attention, they see customer satisfaction, they're winning awards as the best place to work, the best company within their industry, and they're being asked to speak at different and, – and, and how is this happening? Because they took the decision that they knew they were already pretty good at something, but what can we do to give it and make it more purposeful? By the way, that's a real important concept too. Many of the companies that I work with, I look at what their metrics are. I look at what their net promoter score or customer satisfaction scores are. And I say, you're doing really well. And they go, yeah, I know uh, we do well, but I'm not sure why we're doing well. And I could tell you why as I look at their process, they care. But what would happen if they became more purposeful about certain areas? Even though it's working, let's make sure it's operationalized in a way that gives little room for variance as opposed to just, you know, we hired good people and they're doing a great job. <laughs> well, let's make sure they're trained. Not only they they come in doing a great job, but let's make sure they are consistent with how they're doing a great job. And uh, when we put that purposefulness behind it, we create the processes, we create standards. And at the same time, we empower them to step outside of that uh, box, if you will, to say, okay, I've got another idea that might be good. But here's the key. We have this this exercise that we put our clients through when we do workshops and we tell them to do it on and on. And we want our our employees to try something new. But if they do, they can't keep it silent. They have to actually write it up, share it with their manager or their supervisor or somebody at the company because if it's working, everybody needs to know how to do it. And so that's where we come in as we help companies put that type of program together. But that's what companies need to be thinking about today. Don't be good by accident. Be good because uh, maybe it starts out by accident, but create purposefulness to it. On that topic of uh, collecting feedback from customers and creating a feedback loop that makes its way into the business to improve, uh, do you have any hacks or any any good experiences of how to how to speed that up? Because a lot right. of the brands that we've worked with, they have those processes, but they're so delayed. They take two, three, four months, sometimes longer to make their way back into the business. Have you worked on anything that's different? Well, I mean, that's just a decision that the company has to make. If, if they're going to get feedback, what are they using the feedback for? And if they're not using it, why are they wasting everybody's time doing it? So number one, the ask for feedback has to be timely. Number two, if you want good feedback quickly, don't give somebody a 20-minute questionnaire. Give them two or three sentences yeah. or questions where uh, maybe on a scale of uh, zero to 10, what's the likelihood you recommend this? Uh if somebody gives us a number, great. Now we have a quick score. That took all of about 10 seconds, 15 seconds for them to give us that. Maybe a little longer if they really had to think. How about another question? On a scale of 0 to 10, uh, how would you rate the experience specific to the person you dealt with? Now you're going to get a little bit more granular. But once again, it's 10, 15 seconds. And maybe one other open-ended question. Is there anything you could think of that would make the experience better? It, by the way, you can use any question, but that's an example. Three questions, a minute or two, and here's the key. You don't need to ask every single customer, but you don't want to ask only your best customers, so it can be random. If I've got uh, 10,000 customers, I'm a large company, I only need to ask 1,000, 1,500 of them, 2,000, that question, to get really good feedback. Then change the questions and ask different questions because you're going to get a sample size and it's going to be big enough. And then Take a look at these numbers on a regular basis, and I would suggest somebody be looking at them weekly to determine, is there opportunity? Are we seeing some of the same? That, By the way, that question I said, uh, the third one, is there one thing you can think of that would make the experience better? That is a powerful question, and somebody managing surveys can look at this and say, you know what? We've had 42 customers ask for the same thing. Maybe this is an opportunity, and let's not wait four months to get it together. Let's start working on how we can do it right away. That, and that quick feedback collection will make its way, hopefully, back into the business quicker to then yep. drive whatever process or change to the operational model that will make a difference. So, Right. You mentioned banks earlier, and uh, we do work with a very, very large bank with hundreds of branches. 
And every single day the manager gets, or actually comes in the middle of the night, uh, the net promoter scores of what their customers thought of them from that day. I mean, I'm not saying they get hundreds of them, but they get a few. They also get these verbatims, uh, the, the, the actual open-ended question that gives them, uh, you know, like the one thing question I mentioned, uh, there's an actual answer. And each yeah. branch gets its verbatims and their NPS scores. And every morning before the doors open, they spend a few minutes going over those from the day before. They're learning tools. Wow, uh, we got a great compliment from a customer. Do we do this all the time? Let's start doing it all the time. Let's make sure we share this with somebody so they could share with the other branches. Or, hey, we had a problem. Let's talk about how we're going to handle it the next time this happens. And it's also a great way if things are going well, and I love this. Uh, a friend of mine, he passed away. He owned a restaurant here in town uh, where I live. And it was one of the best restaurants. And he constantly got accolades about the food and the service. And he would read those right before the doors open as kind of a motivating, uh, it, you know, like, hey, we're doing great. But then he would say, just remember those doors open in just a few minutes and we get to start over. So every day is an opportunity to start over. And if we yeah. have the attitude to try to do better today than yesterday, if that's even possible, let's try and do it. And with that kind of an attitude, you know, how can you lose? It's, it's a good winning attitude. And that concludes the end of the episode. Thank you to everyone for listening. I've been Octavian and I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Let us know what you think by carrying on the conversation on LinkedIn. This episode has been brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Now let's get into some quick fire questions. What's your favorite holiday? Favorite holiday? Well, I love get to know your customers day. <laughs> <laughs> Four times a year, focused on your customers. <laughs> I love uh, customer uh, customer loyalty month, which comes in April, which is focusing on creating loyalty. Uh, those are favorite business holidays. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I invented those holidays, and somehow or another, they have made their way into the international business calendars. I don't know how that happened, but uh, it's crazy. Uh, but you know, here in the U.S. Uh, we have Thanksgiving. And uh, what I love about Thanksgiving is that obviously I always appreciate everything, but it is the time when my family gets together and we are all together and nothing makes me happier than to be with my family. What's your favorite musical band? Yeah, I love music. I play music. I play guitar and uh, actually had an opportunity to play with John Mayer the other night on YouTube. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, just turned on the video and played along with them. <laughs> Seriously, though, love John Mayer, love Eric Clapton. I love Sting. How about the Beatles? Who doesn't love the Beatles? What's your favorite sport? Ice hockey. I, I, I play hockey. I still play several times a week with a bunch of old guys. And the only rule is we're not allowed to hit each other anymore. <laughs> we just play and have fun. So no fighting? No fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that you do have... A team. You're wearing your team. So right, right. I have. A, I actually have a St. Louis Blues uh, pullover. And if you look behind me, you see hockey pucks. Uh, those are all the players that I played with. And you'll see a jersey that says uh, St. Louis Blues alumni. And who do the boxing gloves belong to? Ah, those. Are, that's. I met Muhammad Ali. Oh, really? And it's hard to see, but underneath is wow. a picture of the champ and me uh, hanging out together. I, I met him a number of times and those gloves are signed by him. Wow. Incredible. That, that is incredible. That is amazing.